This video will discuss performing a paracentesis at Boston University Medical Center. The American Board of Internal Medicine requires competency in a number of procedures listed here. For the core internal medicine bedside procedures, such as central line placement, lumbar puncture, thoracentesis, and paracentesis, it is important to know, understand, and explain the indications, contraindications, complications, sterile techniques, and to be able to appropriately handle the specimens, interpret the results, and gather informed consent. The ABIM stops short of requiring a minimum number of procedures for board eligibility, but notes that each resident should ideally be an active participant in each procedure at least five times. Unfortunately, many internal medicine residents report being inadequately trained, and program directors agree that many graduating residents do not master the essential procedure skills. This video is part of a curriculum to enhance the procedural education at Boston Medical Center and will focus on what is essential knowledge for board eligibility. When considering whether your patient needs a paracentesis, there are two generally accepted indications, those done for diagnostic purposes in order to determine the etiology of an unknown ascites or diagnosed SPP, and those done for therapeutic purposes or symptomatic improvement. Some hepatologists recommend that all patients with cirrhosis and ascites who are admitted to a hospital undergo surveillance paracentesis since occult SPP is not uncommon in these patients. Like any procedure, paracentesis may be associated with risks, although very large studies of more than 4,000 patients report a low overall risk. While the appropriate coagulation profile to safely perform a paracentesis is not known, it is generally accepted that INR is greater than 1.5 normal, platelets less than 25,000, and creatinine greater than 6 are associated with risks of bleeding. Prior surgery or known adhesions creates loculated pockets which could lead to difficult access and tethered bowel which can be perforated. Lastly, care must be taken not to traverse areas of superficial infection when accessing the peritoneal space as theoretical seeding can occur. Before doing a paracentesis, albumin is sometimes given. Albumin is generally considered if SBP is known or suspected, or the operator plans on removing more than four to five liters of fluid. The usual dose of albumin is six to eight grams of albumin per liter expected removed, dosed just before or after the procedure. The consent form at Boston Medical Center, unfortunately, is a blank consent form and relies on the operator to insert the name of the procedure, details, and associated risks. All too often, it is common for consent forms just to be listed with the medical name of the procedure alone, like thoracentesis. This is an inadequate consent and would not appropriately document a discussion of the risk benefits of such a procedure, even if it did in fact happen. After consent, a timeout is then performed. This is a joint commission requirement during which the operator and another individual usually the nurse caring for the patient, perform a checklist to confirm the correct patient, procedure, side, and other necessary items. At BMC, all individuals, including the nurse and doctor operators, must initial the green timeout sticker, which is placed on the reverse side of the consent form. After consent and timeout, equipment can be gathered and set up. All of the equipment pictured here is required, including a mask, sterile gown, gloves, sterile table cover, extra chlorhexidine swabs, collection bottles or suction container, and a Kimberly Clark paracentesis kit containing a Caudwell needle. We have found, along with other hepatology experts, that the larger plastic catheter supplied in the thoracentesis kit is associated with increased complications and kinking when used for a paracentesis. Therefore, the Kimberly Clark kit is used containing a Caudwell needle. The kit contains all the necessary items for a paracentesis, including sterile drapes, lidocaine needles and lidocaine itself, a knife, and the Caudwell needle. The patient is then positioned supine with the head of the bed slightly elevated to allow gravity to bring the fluid inferiorly. It may help to max inflate the air cushion in order to provide more stability of the bed. Hands are then sanitized. 
and the anatomic position localized. The traditional site to perform a paracentesis was either of three locations, the bilateral lower quadrants or directly midline two centimeters below the umbilicus. The umbilicus location is generally less favored as ultrasound studies have shown that abdominal wall thickness is greater here and fluid pockets smaller. Additionally, while this site is thought to be devoid of vasculature, there is potential to have a recanalized umbilical vein which can bleed if punctured. Instead, the lower quadrant locations are typical. They are located two to four centimeters medial and cephalad to the superior iliac spine when palpable. Care must be taken to perform the procedure lateral enough to avoid the inferior epigastric vessels outlined here. While no large studies have been done to show improvement in outcomes, ultrasound is routinely used at Boston Medical Center as an adjunct to help localize acidic fluid. It is therefore important for the resident to recognize typical ultrasound pictures, including the liver, shown here, the spleen, shown here, and free acidic fluid with bowel tethered to the mesentery and an appropriate place to do a paracentesis. Once a site is selected, it is marked and the patient is sterilized. The operator is gowned, gloved, and a sterile table is set up. Then the patient is draped with a smaller fenestrated drape and a larger half sheet. Anesthesia is then done with a 23 gauge needle first, producing a small superficial wheel. A longer and larger gauge needle is changed and anesthesia proceeds all the way to the peritoneum. A small incision is then made. The actual needle for the paracentesis is called a Caldwell needle. It's a rigid metal cannula with a needle through the center. The Z technique is used to perform a paracentesis. In this technique, designed to reduce the probability of a prolonged acidic leakage in tense ascites, the walls of the abdomen are deliberately misaligned with traction before insertion of the needle. The needle is then introduced straight into the abdomen. Upon removal of the needle, the abdominal walls return to their normal state, thereby misaligning the holes and thus sealing the abdominal cavity. Notice how one operator is providing traction while another is holding the Caudwell needle with two hands. The needle and cannula are advanced with drawing back on the syringe until fluid is encountered. At that point, the entire apparatus is advanced a couple more millimeters fully into the abdominal cavity and the metal cannula is slid over the needle. The needle is then removed. It's said that if the Z technique was done properly, the needle will be sitting at a slight angle. The tubing is then attached to the Caudwell needle, and the other end is spiked into a suction bottle. Occasionally, vacutainer bottles are not available, and larger suction tubing has to be used and hooked to the wall suction. The wall suction can be placed at maximum suction without harm. After fluid removal, the cannula is removed and pressure applied. It is imperative to correctly collect the specimens so the appropriate studies are done. I find that collecting the peritoneal fluid in a 50 cc syringe and then introducing it to individual blood tubes is best. A cell count is run off an anticoagulated purple top with chemistry is done from a yellow SST tube. It is also helpful to instill 10 cc's or so into a completely empty container such as a white top tube or a urine container from microbiologic, cytologic, or other studies. Each individual tube must be labeled with the patient sticker. Any remaining acidic fluid, including the full vacuum container bottles, should be disposed of in the red bin in the dirty utility room. The typical acidic fluid tests include chemistry, particularly albumin, LDH, and amylase, cell count, micro, and cytology.
A key measurement is the SAG, the serum ascites albumin gradient. A gradient greater than 1.1 is associated with ascites from portal hypertension. A gradient of less than 1.1 is associated with ascites from more inflammatory causes. Although complications after a paracentesis are unusual, they can happen. Bleeding happens in about 0.2% of patients. Persistent leakage is one of the most common complications in about 5%. And hypotension and hepatorenal syndrome from rapid fluid shifts are also possible. After the procedure is done, a templated note in SCM is used for documentation.